Hello, the year is 2014 and this summer everybody is talking about how you can donate money to the ALS Association. I have, right before publishing this video, donated $100 through this website called ALSA.org. But why are people talking about this? It's because a challenge went viral online, the so-called ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. One have to fill a bucket full of ice and water and dump it on yourself and then donate about $10 to the ALS research and then nominate three other people to take part of it. Those who refuse to take part of the challenge should donate $100. This may sound like a stupid silly idea but if you compare how much money were donated in 2013 compared to this summer 2014 then you realize that it really works. And who does these things? Almost everybody. Ranging from people like Bill Gates, Oprah Winfrey, I mean Cristiano Ronaldo, Roger Federer, Mark Zuckerberg and, and uh, yes even George W. Bush. The list is endless. Many friends of mine are doing it and YouTube and Facebook are full of all kinds of versions. So what does ALS stand for? Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. This is a worldwide neurodegenerative disease this means that the nervous system structure gets destroyed and with time it gets worse and worse. And it usually causes death within five years because of respiratory failure. Do we have a cure? No. And this is one of the reasons that we donate money for research. Are you or I at risk of getting the disease? The incidence is about three people in 100,000. To get this number in perspective, let's imagine that more than 1 million people have done this ice bucket challenge. Then out of these people, about 30 poor individuals will have ALS and will die within a couple of years. And among these, the majority will be men, which are 40 years or older. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis have many more names. Charcot disease, Lou Gehrig disease, motor neuron disease. To answer why we have different names for the same disease, let's turn to some short history. We have known this disease for about 150 years and still we haven't found any cure. It all began when a French doctor Jean-Martin Charcot first described ALS in the 1870s. Then ALS became a famous disease in 1939 when an American baseball legend Lou Gehrig died from this disease. In 96, we invented a drug called Rilutec that could help these patients. But with help, I mean prolonging life only a couple of months. Now, about 150 years later, we have realized that we have to do something about this problem. So we created the Ice Bucket Challenge. With donations of millions of dollars from all over the world, we, the people, are doing our share. Now it's up to the researchers to find a solution. So now you know why it's called Charcot or Lou Gehrig, but what about the name amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or motor neuron disease? What does this mean? Imagine that you want to raise your leg. What's the first thing that, what, that will happen? Your brain decides that I want to raise my leg. Then a part of your brain, the upper motor neuron, in your precentral gyrus sends signals through the highway of your nervous system called the pyramidal tract. Here the signal travels fast down through your spinal cord, through the internal capsule, cerebral peduncle, pons, medulla, into the lateral horn of your spinal cord, then into the anterior horn. And here there are lower motor neurons that will send the signal further to your muscles which will contract and then you lift up your leg. Now let's get back to my question. What does amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and motor neuron disease mean? We said that we have an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron. The upper motor neuron in the brain sending the signals to the lower motor neuron. In ALS there is damage of the motor neurons and therefore it's classified as a motor neuron disease together with other types, because in ALS there is damage in both the upper and lower motor neurons, which is different from other types of motor neuron diseases that usually only affect either one. 
the name amyotrophic lateral sclerosis means without muscle nutrition. There's no nutrition to the muscles since the lower motor neurons are damaged. The lateral spinal cord is scarring, so the fast pyramidal tract don't work and the upper motor neuron cannot send the signals to the lower one. Now let's see what all this leads to. I will introduce a great man. His name is Stephen Hawking. The year is 1963. He's a first year doctoral student, a young 21 year old guy who loves physics and cosmology. He enters into a lovely relationship with Jane Wilde. Then bad things start to happen. He starts to feel clumsy, falling when walking on stairs, and his speech becomes slurred. He visits the doctor who tells him that the diagnosis is motor neuron disease. You will die within two years. Young Stephen falls into deep depression. But Jane Wilde, his girlfriend, does not leave him. The relationship becomes even stronger. And one year later, in 64, they get engaged. And this engagement gives him something to live for. The disease progresses. He cannot talk anymore. Uh, he cannot walk either. But it doesn't matter. Because now we have the power, the enthusiasm to even continue studying. Cosmology and physics are things that he loves to do. And he developed the reputation of being excellent. So what do patients with ALS complain about? What are the symptoms? You already know two of them. Difficulty walking and speaking. And how can this happen? You know, you know the answer to this question too. I describe how it's possible to raise a leg. So if there is a damage of upper motor neuron or the pyramidal tract or the lower motor neuron, then it's impossible to raise your leg, thereby difficulty walking. How about speaking? The same thing he again here, but with the difference that now there's a damage higher up in your spinal cord, in your brainstem, which innervates the muscles of speech. So in the beginning, Stephen fell down from stairs, had slurred speech. The muscles still worked, but they were weaker. We call this paresis. Then later on, since this is a degenerative disease, it became worse and worse. And with time, he developed paralysis, which is complete loss of muscle function. Whether you get paralysis or paresis depends on how many motor neurons are damaged. If only some motor neurons are affected, then paresis happens. But if all motor neurons are affected, then complete paralysis results. In ALS, it starts with paresis and continues with paralysis. Let me quickly mention some more symptoms. If you cannot speak because of your muscles being paralysed, you can imagine how hard it is to eat. We call this dysphagia. The muscles are not paralysed all at the same time. It usually starts in a single muscle group, like your arm, and then it continues asymmetrically in a random fashion, eventually affecting all your striated muscles, except your extraocular muscles and your heart. So these patients will have a beating heart with vision intact. Furthermore, they will have a normal bladder and bowel movement. The sensory system will be normal also, which includes vision, hearing, touch, taste, and smell, and so on. Now let's turn to the doctor's perspective here. Pretend that you are a doctor. The patient comes in and tells all the symptoms we mentioned until now. Plus, now let's add some more. One unusual symptom of ALS can be involuntary laughter or crying if there is pseudobulbar palsy, which is a damage to the upper motor neurons of the cranial nerves controlling the facial muscles. The patients can cry for things that are not even sad and they cannot stop themselves from several minutes or they just laugh at anything that are not funny or even laugh when they are angry. So it's an emotional ability called pseudobulbar effect. Let's see some more symptoms. You have this table. In the left side there are signs for upper motor neuron damage and on the right side for the lower motor neuron damage. Muscle groups here are affected compared to individual muscles. Mild weakness is for both. 
minimal atrophy, atrophy meaning without nutrition, and this leads to muscle shrinkage. For lower motor neuron damage, there's a lot of atrophy. Increased muscle stretch reflex. Imagine the leg, when a doctor tries to bend the leg, it's very hard in the beginning, but suddenly it bends very fast and easy. This is called the clasp knife sp spasticity. The same thing there, when you try to close it, suddenly it returns to its position. In lower motor neuron damage, there are decreased stretch reflexes called hyporeflexia. No fasciculations. Fasciculations mean that there's muscle twitch. You have probably experienced it a number of times, but it's not dangerous. In ALS it's more severe and, and it is found in lower motor neuron damage. We can see clonus in upper motor neuron damage, but not in lower motor neuron damage. Clonus is a violent, confused muscular contraction and relaxation. Unlike twitches, which are small motions, clonus are large muscle motions. Lastly, there is a Babinski sign in upper motor neuron damage. Here, the doctor takes a sharp tool and scratches the plantar surface of the foot, which creates a Babinski reflex meaning that the toes fan and extend upwards. Normally and in lower motor neuron damage, the toes will flex downwards instead. To complicate the story a bit, we mentioned that ALS is affecting both upper and lower motor neurons. So what about all these symptoms then? Yes, they will be mixed, depending on which syndrome is dominant, the most upper or the lower. In the beginning, it may start as an upper motor neuron syndrome and then eventually the lower one gets affected also. So if the doctor recognized that this is an upper motor disease, then he should pay attention to if it progresses to lower motor neuron symptoms too. If not, if it stays as an upper motor neuron disease only, then we have to rule out other diseases because other diseases may be treatable compared to ALS which doesn't have any cure. So here are some examples of other diseases. You can stop the video now and read this through if you are interested. But before we continue though, I want to highlight the SOD1, which is one of the DNA mutations linked to ALS. Usually the disease is not inherited, and then we call it sporadic. But sometimes, about 5-10% to 10 of cases, it will be inherited. And then it's called familial ALS. As a doctor, we have seen many symptoms now, we have done our physical examination, so the last thing we can do to be sure that the patient is having ALS is to perform some tests, like electromyography, MRI and blood tests, to exclude other diseases in this table. Last but not least, our respiratory problems. We know by now that all muscles become weak, and the respiratory muscles are not spared. Eventually, this will lead to respiratory failure and death within five years. So this is the most common and dangerous side effect of ALS. Now comes the important question you may ask. I have explained the disease process. I have explained how we can diagnose it. And now I'm supposed to explain how to treat it. And here we have a problem. Because I cannot give you a real cure. Because there is not enough knowledge about how to cure ALS. And one of the main reasons why I'm delivering this presentation now is to somehow contribute to this big movement which collect a lot of money for research so that these poor people never again have to hear me saying we cannot help you, you will die. So the only management today is to give Rilozole to prolong life a bit, respiratory support to prevent death as long as possible, helping in nutrition by gastrostomy since it is impossible to swallow, and using speech synthesizers, which is a computer program that converts text into speech, and in this way ALS patients are able to communicate with other people. You should never under underestimate this power of communication with loved ones, because the psychological support can be of great benefit. And I didn't finish the story of Stephen Hawking. That's because the story is not finished. The doctor told him when he was 21 years old that he would have two years left. He lives today and he's 72 years old. 
we cannot blame the doctor because it's true that most of the people with ALS die within two to five years. But the message here is that support from your loved ones, a deep desire to live and having inspiring goals for the future are probably some factors for his success in life. He don't have small goals. He dared to dream big.